so Breaking Bad's having a little bit of a renaissance right now. Everyone's watching it, it's in every single meme. You can't get away from it, but I'm not complaining because it's a fantastic show. And so is its spin-off, Better Call Saul, which has also been getting a lot of attention as of late. And it's not hard to see why with its incredibly rich three-dimensional characters. One may even say it's the best show on television right now. Or at least, so we thought. In 2022, we found out that Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul were both pawns in a larger game. Mere launching pads so that AMC could unleash upon the world the real show they'd been planning to make for all this time. And that show is Slippin' Jimmy! Suddenly, Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul comparatively seemed like trash. <laughs> Since 2008, AMC had been flying in the world's finest writers in secret to write and rewrite episodes. Over a 10 year period, the episodes were refined to the point of perfection, like carbon being compressed into a diamond. Ever wanted to see Saw Goodman as an animated kid? Well, now you can. Every frame is a painting. Every joke lands. <laughs> and they make those poultry Better Call Saul jokes look feeble in comparison. Squad Cobbler. Oh my god. Oh, hell no. Okay, I'm done goofing around. I'm gonna be serious now. What the fuck is this? Who, who commissioned this? Why is Peter Gold listed as an executive producer? Why did you let this happen, Peter? Someone at AMC genuinely thought to themselves that a show in the style of Big Mouth was the next logical step for the Breaking Bad universe. Fucking big mouth. Oh my god. I can just imagine the business meeting when the suits at AMC were like, Hey Vince Gilligan, thanks for giving us two of our most successful dramas. Uh, if you don't mind, we're gonna turn it into Family Guy now. That's cool, right? Uh... Okay, great. Just to set the stage, the market is already oversaturated enough with these awful adult animated shows, mostly thanks to Netflix, that all recycle the same predictable joke formulas and all share the same low effort character designs. I can barely even tell that Slip and Jimmy isn't just a character in one of these other shows. The only real indicators are that the movement is a little bit more jagged and the outlines are weirdly thick, which makes everything look a bit uglier. Why do all of these shows look the same. When I was googling Slip and Jimmy, I literally found fan posters that had a better looking character design than what's in the actual show. Whereas we get spanned with dozens and dozens of these terrible shows every year that no one wants, adult animated dramas are almost non-existent. Where are the adult animated dramas? Oh right, I forgot. They require effort and talent to make, and you can't mass produce them with a team of Flash animators and a Seth MacFarlane wannabe. And this is an especially egregious case because these are such weird characters to pick for a comedic, wholesome show. Like, Jimmy and Marco? Spoiler alert for if you haven't seen Better Call Saul. But, um... Marco fucking dies at the end of season one. And it's a really depressing death too. His heart just gives out and Jimmy's left cradling him alone in an alleyway. You do realize that the whole time I'm watching the show, I'm just gonna be thinking about the fact that it all leads here ultimately, right? Okay. Anyways, we're gonna slip our way through all six episodes of this show and figure out not only why it exists, but if there was ever any chance it could have been good. Episode one. Fistful of Snowballs. So based on the fact that this episode is called Fistful of Snowballs, you've probably already worked out that this is gonna be a Fistful of Dollars parody. It feels like a strange choice to open the first episode with a mostly silent scene like this, because with no dialogue, there's nothing to distract me from how awful the animation looks. The art style of the backgrounds does not match up with the art styles of the characters, and you can see that they fucked up the export at points, leaving white pixels around stuff. Hey fellas, you seen Marco around? You may also notice that the guy voicing Jimmy doesn't sound anything like Bob Odenkirk, but if anything that's a blessing because it helps keep this show feel separate from Better Call Saul. It's at this point, after two full minutes of almost nothing but Clint Eastwood stares, that we get our very first joke. You bring a sled for me? I guess was shy one sled. Uh, I think you brought two too many. Um, I don't get it. Listen, you've got three sleds, but I only need one. There's four of us, and then I take three of you out. And then one of me takes one. He's trying to make us do math! Get him! 
So that was fucking awful. My personal advice to you if you want to make a joke funny is, um... Don't linger on it for so long that it becomes painful. Almost every joke in this episode is conducted like that, by the way. Get used to it. Who's the fastest snowball slinger in town? Me or the boy with no name? Wait, he doesn't have a name. He has a name. So he has a name, but you don't know what it is? No, no. The no name thing is like a nickname. Oh, that makes me feel like you don't know his name. Ah, oh I my god, I name. get it. So if it wasn't clear at this point, the main joke behind this episode is that it's a reference to Old West films. In fact, there are a lot of jokes throughout the show that expect you to laugh just because it's referencing something. Reference humor can be funny, but you have to make sure that your joke stands on its own as, like, an actual joke. Good reference humor is funny even to people who don't get the reference. Community comes to mind as an example of a show that references pop culture constantly, but does so in such a way that the references work within the story and stand as jokes of their own. Here's nobody can hear you. Well, I'm hot and my balls are touching a zipper. Like, yeah, they're referencing the gimp from Pulp Fiction, but they made an actual joke about what it would be like to actually have to wear that suit. They didn't just recreate a scene from Pulp Fiction exactly as it was and just think it was funny because it's with different characters now. I watched the show when I was a kid and I didn't get half the pop culture references, but still found the jokes funny. And if you want an example of an animated show that pulls this off, look no further than Futurama. Okay, back to Slippin' Jimmy. So basically, Jimmy's friend Marco has been captured by some bullies, so Jimmy has to rescue him. So you'd probably expect some hijinks to ensue along the way, or at the very least, some kind of unexpected ending, right? So here's what happens. Jimmy throws snowballs at bullies, then he finds Marco, then there's an extended scene where he throws more snowballs at bullies, then he rescues Marco, and they leave. And that's it that somehow takes 10 minutes. There's no surprises, there are no twists or turns. Well, if you wanna be generous, I guess there's one moment at the end when a bully gets up and throws a snowball at Jimmy and then Marco dives in front of it, but then he just gets back up and the episode ends. Everything, including every single joke, is so painfully predictable that it robs them of any chance they might have had of being funny. An important element of comedy is an element of surprise, but this show does not have that at all. Dr. Quackenbush said your rash won't go away unless you wear your special mittens, <laughs> Now, I understand that you shouldn't subvert expectations just for the sake of subverting expectations. I'm not David Benioff. But you can at least subvert them a little. Let's just look at an episode of Futurama for comparison. In one episode, Fry has to deliver a package to a mysterious planet that's very hot. So he goes there, but he gets very thirsty in the sweltering heat. So he drinks a bottle of water conveniently laid out. Except surprise, turns out that that was actually the emperor of the planet because it's inhabited by water people. You drank our emperor! So now he's fucked. Except no, he's not, because surprise, in their constitution, the person who drank the last emperor becomes emperor. Your fate is sealed! I'll hail the new emperor! So now he's emperor. Hey, thanks. Wow, this got here just in time. Except he's in incredible danger because every emperor gets assassinated within about a week of taking power. But before anyone can assassinate him, surprise, it turns out the last emperor is actually still alive in his stomach. He's still alive! Now cut this creep open and drain me out! My tummy hurts. So now he needs to find a way to get the emperor out, unless he wants to die. Why don't you just sweat him out? Forget it. As Emperor, I refuse to be dripped out through somebody's armpit. So he decides to try to cry the Emperor out, but he can't get himself to cry, so then everyone just fucking beats him up until he cries the Emperor out. <gasps> hey, hey, wait a minute. Who are you? I'm the Emperor. Thanks for crying me out. Oh, you're welcome. And that's the plot, and I love it. It keeps you on your toes, but it's constantly funny, and there's still a lesson to be learned in there because Fry creates all of his own problems by never listening to Leela and never accepting anyone's help. You drank a bottle of strange blue liquid? It could have been poisonous acid. It could have been, but chances were equally good it was an emperor. This feels like the bare foundation of an idea for an episode, you know? Before they added actual jokes. As it is, it's just so painfully flat. Ah. The special mittens with the ointment Ooh. in the lining. Mom, I'm right in the middle of something. Episode 2, The Exorcister. 
Oh my god. Is this going to be a reference to OMG The Exorcist? It's referencing The Exorcist, guys! So Jimmy and Marco get sent to detention at Sunday school because Jimmy put a sheet on a teacher's back that said Pope Me. And I'm still trying to figure out how that's an insult or why this resulted in Marco getting sent to detention as well, but I'll just button my lip. So they arrive at detention and their teacher farts tadpoles on them. What the frogs? I would like to remind you that this is permanently attached to the Breaking Bad universe. Uh-oh, their detention supervisor is actually possessed by a demon. Then she barfs purple liquid on the bully. Uh, I gotta take a leak. <laughs> causing him to start talking about crypto. Crypto is the future of money. Capital cannot be created by printing fiat currency. The bubble will rise, world without end. Congratulations. You referenced the existence of crypto. That's, that's fucking hilarious, man. That is indeed a thing that exists. Uh, never mind that this show takes place in the fucking 70s and it makes no sense. Let's just reference more random things. You know, I'm disappointed they didn't throw any Will Smith slapping Chris Rock jokes in there. Because that would have been an absolute knee slapper. There are two types of jokes in this show. Super telegraph jokes for babies that overstay their welcome. Uh, there's one, two, 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 two. three. Three, right! And references. Richard Nixon? There is virtually no joke in the entire show that is not one of these two types. So here's the premise of this episode. Their teacher is possessed by a demon and they have to try to exercise her. So basically, they do that. And then a portal to hell opens and they squeeze in a few more crypto references. A well-functioning full capital depends on reasonable government regulation. <laughs> and then it's fucking done. That's it. <laughs> Again, the writers established a conundrum in the first few minutes. The characters formulated their plan A, and then they just did plan A perfectly, and then it ends. There's nothing unexpected. You already know exactly what's gonna happen three minutes in. Okay, if I can give credit where credit's due, they have one kind of twist in this episode right before the end, which is that the demon comes back and then possesses this guy from the beginning. But instead of turning evil, he just kind of acts the same way he did before. But now he crawls on walls, though. Pull your pants up. No one wants to see that. Patricia, the Bibles aren't going to study themselves. And that's it for surprises. Couldn't you have saved the reveal that the teacher is possessed by a demon for the end? You could have had it start small. Jimmy and Marco want to escape detention, so they cook up a plan. But then everything starts going south for some bizarre reason. Maybe the door suspiciously locks itself or something, foiling their plan. And then generally more and more weird stuff starts happening. You could even throw a red herring in there and make it seem like this guy is responsible for messing with them before revealing at the end that the teacher was the culprit all along. And oh yeah, she's also possessed by Satan. It's called raising the stakes, something that should be done gradually throughout an episode. As it stands, everything goes berserk at the very beginning of the episode, and then it just stagnates, staying at the exact same intensity the whole time. Which, suffice to say, makes the viewing experience quite boring. Episode 3 after bedtime. I don't even know what to say about this one. It's like Jimmy and Marco want to get a new comic book. So they sneak out at night, but then the taxi they get into is actually driven by a pirate who wants to kill them, I guess, because that's what pirates do. So Jimmy pretends to be the son of Poseidon, and it works somehow, and then some bullies show up, and Jimmy throws baby powder in their faces, and then they get the comic book. What the fuck kind of randomly generated plot is this? And yet, they still manage to make it as predictable and telegraphed as possible. The writers make sure that you know about the baby powder before it gets used in the climax. Remember that time we found a fiver in your pencil case? Maybe we'll get lucky again. A surprising amount of baby powder. Aw uh, gee, I sure wonder if this baby powder that they're stopping the whole episode to show to me is gonna be important to the plot later. But before we proceed, let's take a moment to talk about the slipster himself, Jimmy McGill. I don't expect him to act the same way he does in Better Call Saul, obviously. This isn't the same kind of show. But I did expect him to, you know, be slippin'. He's supposed to cook up elaborate schemes that involve manipulating people in clever, small ways into doing what he wants. That's a great vehicle to derive comedy, and even Better Call Saul, which is primarily a drama, does this. You guys have liability insurance, right? 
Any one of Jimmy's schemes from Better Call Saul blows anything from slipping Jimmy out of the water. Squat Cobbler, of course, coming to mind at the time he defended his client by convincing the police that he was a fetish video artist. What the hell is a squat cobbler? It's when a man sits in pie and he, he wiggles around. Which then meant that to prove his innocence, his client had to record actual fetish videos. There is, however, one little tiny hanging chad. What, what chad? You're gonna have to make a video. Now that's the kind of slip in Jimmy I wanna see. Ooh, yummy. Who, le who left this pie here? Oh, I think, I think I feel berries. <laughs> but for some reason, this comedy show hardly ever utilizes Jimmy's schemes for comedic effect. In fact, one of the only times we ever get to see him manipulate someone is in this episode when he convinces the pirate driver guy that he's Theseus. Or I am Theseus. Son of Poseidon, master of water. Now let us out and be washed away by my father's power. Sometimes it's like the writers start to become self-aware as to how childish the show is. So then they just throw in a random adult reference Crypto. or slightly inappropriate word. Fanny. And this is another case where the episode ends so straightforwardly that I was actually taken aback. They go to the comic book store and then, spoiler alert for Better Call Saul season one if you haven't seen it, they have a line that references Marco's death. This is the best night of my life. Jimmy, you know what? Save your breath, okay? You're gonna be fine. This was the greatest week of my life. Why the fuck would you want me to be thinking about that right now? And then they just head inside and buy the comic book successfully, with no line for some reason, even though they said there'd be one at the beginning. The comic shop is gonna be packed, so we gotta be there, in line, early. And then it just ends. And it seems like they ran out of what little animation budget they must have had because they just conduct the ending through voiceover as you stare at the outside of the shop. Oh man. Number 100 is ours. It is everything I imagined it would be. There's no comedic twist at all. They just succeed. And I don't want to see success with no struggle. And of all the jokes they could have ended the episode with, they end it with this. Wait, what do you know? It is cheese. Yeah, it's a clever one, because at the beginning, Jimmy asked Marco, what do you think Lady Labyrinth will find at the end of the labyrinth? We'll finally know what's at the end of the maze of malice. And then Marco was like, I bet she'll find cheese. Oh, it's cheese. I can feel it. And then the audience explodes with laughter because he, he said the cheese word. And then at the end, it turns out that it actually was cheese. It is cheese. This is something paid writers came up with. There's like an uncountable number of other twist endings you could have gone with that would have been infinitely cleverer than this. What if the pirate driver taxi guy was actually just a big fan of comic books and the reason he was acting like a pirate is because it was a reference to a comic book and he wasn't trying to kidnap them, he was just trying to take them to his house where he had a copy of the comic they wanted. And then it ends with a sad shot of him next to a giant pile of comics being like, I just wanted to read the comics with someone. Oh, sad pirate noise. Literally anything would have been funnier than LMAO CHEESE! Now, if there's any Slippin' Jimmy stands out there arguing, well, these episodes are only 10 minutes long, so it's not fair for you to expect the same that you'd expect of a 20 minute show, I would rebuke that claim by pointing out that Spongebob episodes are also only 10 minutes long each. Or more accurately, each 20 minute episode contains two 10 minute stories. Think about how much more the average Spongebob episode is able to accomplish in its runtime than any of these episodes so far. The pizza delivery episode alone has five times as many twists and turns as anything we've seen. Incidentally, this is the only episode of the series that AMC posted for free on YouTube, and the most replayed part of the video is the credits. I think that tells you everything that you need to know. Episode 4, City Fights. This is another gimmick episode, but this time the gimmick is that it's like a silent Buster Keaton film. I don't know why they chose to conduct the episode like this, because it honestly doesn't even relate to the story of the episode, nor does it add anything funny to it. The plot is that Chuck, Jimmy's brother, can't get his radio to work, so Jimmy tries to buy him a record player so that he can listen to his favorite tunes. Then, hijinks ensues. 
the speaker rolls away, so then Jimmy needs to jump the turnstiles in the subway to catch it, but then a cop starts chasing him, so now he needs to escape the cop, and etc. Whereas this episode has the simplest premise, I think it actually works the best of any of the episodes because it actually sticks to that simple premise without throwing in random encounters or unrelated jokes. And it gradually raises the stakes throughout the running time. Hey, look at that, I'm proud. I just wish the animation wasn't awful and it wasn't Saul Goodman I was watching because then I might actually start to enjoy it. I also noticed this episode reusing backgrounds from previous episodes, but it's a low budget animated show so I can cut it some slack. The main thing I'd say about this episode is that, well, it feels like a children's short. I'm not saying that as a bad thing, but again, it's like the plots for all these episodes were made for kids, but then they shoved in references to inappropriate things to try to make adults like it. You boys got hemorrhoids? I really don't know who this show is for. Kids can't watch it because it's inappropriate and it's connected to two extremely adult shows, but I don't know what adult would want to sit through this because it's so childish and unfunny. It doesn't even feel like it's for Better Call Saul fans because there are no references to any Better Call Saul jokes in the entire show. And ending this episode with like a, a wholesome hug between Chuck and Jimmy is so fucking weird for anyone who's seen the show. Again, spoiler alert, but Chuck's time on the show ends when he drives himself completely insane, partially because of his envy of Jimmy, and then he sets himself on fire and dies. I hope you realize that's all I'll be able to think about when I'm watching this scene. I don't want to hurt your feelings, but the truth is, you've never mattered all that much to me. Kind of recontextualizes it in a very bizarre way. Episode 5, Speed Date. This one's just boring as hell. They're on a bus and there's a cute girl that Jimmy has a crush on at the back of the bus. Jimmy wants to ask her out to the dance, but the bully also wants to ask her out, so it's a race between the two of them to get to the back of the bus to win her affection. But look out, if the driver sees either of them get out of their seat, she'll kick them off the bus. I actually forgot about this episode because it's so... Nothing. I'm gonna wedgie you. I think the jokes are at their very worst in this episode. Like, at one point, Jimmy and Marco are using walkie talkies, and Marco says, Roger, Roger. Roger, Roger. Roger. And then a guy called Roger peers over the seat and says, Yes. And Jimmy's like, Oh no, not you, Roger. Yes? No. What? Sorry. Not you, Roger. Fiddlestick. <laughs> These feel like the jokes I'd expect to see on the backyard again. Why are they in an adult comedy? Also, I feel like I'm pissing into the wind a bit here, but why is it so hard to get to the back of the bus? The driver starts, like, looking at porn at one point. Oh, Fernando, you bad boy. Oh, oh, run that yellow. Run it so fast. Squeeze. Which gives both of them a window to just walk straight to the girl. But instead, they painstakingly move one seat at a time. I get that this is a cartoon and I have to suspend my disbelief to some extent. But when the things that the characters are doing don't make sense, then it kind of ruins the tension in the actual episode. The bully gets booted back to the front of the bus at one point, whereas Jimmy is almost there. Trent likes you. Oh, Trent, I knew oh, it! it. Oh, oh, what the oh. heck? I knew you felt the way I do. Let's run away to Paraguay. But then a montage starts and somehow they're both tied again suddenly? What happened to Jimmy's huge lead? Why didn't Jimmy just walk directly to the back? The driver's not looking! So Jimmy gets pushed into the aisle and then kicked off the bus. Hey, Mrs. Bachbrader! <laughs> Last straw, oh, my girl! <laughs> which leads to an epic climax where he clings on to the outside of the bus with gum. Hey, Don Marie. Are you telling me that a man just happens to fall like that? He orchestrated it. Jimmy. He asks the girl out, but she says no. Hey, I, I was wondering, would you like to go to the dance with me? No, I can't go to the dance with you. There are larger geopolitical forces at work. And if I can give credit where credit is due, the episode actually does have a proper climax and a non-straightforward ending. If this were scripted like the first three episodes, the plot would have just been that Jimmy walked directly to the back of the bus with no trouble, asked her out, and then she said yes. And that would somehow take 10 minutes. Even so, they play it as, like, a sad moment instead of a comedic one for some reason, which kind of misses the mark. By the way, the book the driver is reading is called A School Bus Named Desire, and yeah, I get it referenced, but uh, I don't know if they thought that one through fully, because the implications of what she's looking at are a bit... sus. Right, five down, one to go. 
Episode 6, Cool Hand Jimmy. So I don't understand why they made this episode the season finale. This is the episode where Jimmy meets Marco and they pull off their first ever scheme together. You'd think that it would have made sense for it to have been the, I don't know, start of the show, but it's the end of it. It's like Pulp Fiction, it's out of order. Oh, it's also a reference to the Shawshank Redemption because reference. I used to love watching the fresh meat arrive, but Jimmy, Jimmy was different. So Jimmy arrives at a reformation summer camp and then immediately fakes an injury to get out of doing work. So right off the bat, Marco is irritated with Jimmy and Jimmy acts all cocky. You think you can just get out of work? Pretty sure I did get out of it. You just think you're so much better than everybody else, don't you? But then in the very next scene, Jimmy takes the fall for something Marco did for no reason, just to protect him. Somebody had a little fun last night and tried to break into my cooler. James McGill. Sorry, boss. Couldn't help myself. Guess I'm a sucker for ice cream. They just met. They're not friends. Why is Jimmy protecting Marco even though it means he'll be severely punished? Uh, because... Uh... Like I said, the logic doesn't have to be airtight in a cartoon, but the character motivations have to at least make sense. So now Marco and Jimmy are friends, and they hatch a plan to steal ice cream from their instructor. The next scene is, holy shit, actually a genuine scheme. There's a plan that involves a few clever ideas, like baiting squirrels into tripping the motion sensor so that the instructor stops checking after a few times, and making it look like the ice cream was stolen by squirrels. There's also a moment in there when he almost electrocutes himself because I guess he's actually stupid. Jimmy, wait! Oh, thanks. <laughs> but for the most part, he comes across as smart. I can't believe it. It's the very last scene of the very last episode and Jimmy finally be slipping. Imagine if this had been in every episode. Then this show may have been somewhat tolerable. Now it may have just been an ice cream sandwich, but to me, it was everything. Yes, it's like the Shawshank Redemption. I, I comprehend that. Thank you. So there it is, all six episodes of Slippin' Jimmy. Could it have worked? Well, I think beyond everything I just mentioned, a huge issue with the show is the two lead characters. They're both very bland, and worse yet, they never bicker with each other or have any real conflict. Think about any iconic duo from any cartoon. Think about Fry and Bender. Think about Stewie and Brian. Hell, even SpongeBob and Patrick. Even if they get along much of the time, they all argue with each other and have separate goals and motivations, meaning the episodes with them have more going on. Apart from when they first meet, Marco and Jimmy are just always on the same page with each other, and it deprives the show of an important potential source of comedy. There's a reason that every successful duo-led show presents us with two very different main characters. Imagine if Drake and Josh was called Drake and Drake, and the two of them led very, very similar lives and always agreed with each other. The whole show would be... Uh, ruined? I can only imagine how much better the detention episode or the taxi episode might have been if Jimmy and Marco had conflicting plans with each other, and their bickering with one another landed them in sticky situations. But, uh, to be honest, who cares? I don't think any of this really matters. After watching the entire show, short as it may be, I can conclude that this was a terrible idea from the get-go. The execution was bad, that's for sure, but even if the show had had some funny jokes and had been a little more true to the characters, would that even matter? Who wants to watch yet another one of these Family Guy clones, but this time with Saul Goodman duct taped onto it? Nobody. Sister Beth, he who smelt it, dealt it. 